scripture passage this morning is Genesis chapter 24, verses 28 through 67. Pew Bible, page 35. There we left off where Abraham's servant found Rebekah and gave thanks to the Lord for having brought him to this place and uh, led him to the house of his master's relatives and to the very woman that Abraham sent him to retrieve a wife for his son Isaac. Here now the reading of God's holy, inspired, and infallible word. The girl ran and told her mother's household about these things. Now Rebekah had a brother named Laban, and he hurried out to the man at the spring. As soon as he had seen the nose ring and the bracelets on his sister's arms, and had heard Rebekah tell what the man said to her, he went out to the man and found him standing by the camels at the spring. Come, you who are blessed by the Lord, he said. Why are you standing out here? I have prepared the house and a place for the camels. So the man went to the house, and the camels were unloaded. Straw and fodder were brought for the camels, and water for him and his men, too, washed their feet. Then food was set before him, but he said, I will not eat until I have told you what I have to say. Then tell us, Laban said. So he said, I am Abraham's servant. The Lord has blessed my master abundantly, and he has become wealthy. He has given him sheep and cattle, silver and gold, men servants and maid servants, and camels and donkeys. My master's wife, Sarah, has borne him a son in her old age, and he has given him everything he owns. And my master made me swear an oath and said, You must not get a wife for my son from the daughters of the Canaanites in whose land I live, but go to my father's family and to my own clan and get a wife for my son. And I asked my master, What if the woman will not come back with me? He replied, The Lord before whom I have walked will send his angel with you and make your journey a success, so that you can get a wife for my son from my own clan from my father's family. Then you, when you go to my clan, you will be released from my oath, even if they refuse to give her to you. You will be released from my oath. When I came to the spring today, I said, O Lord, God of my master Abraham, if you will, please grant success to the journey in which I have come. See, I am standing beside this spring. If a maiden comes out to draw water, and I say to her, Please let me drink a little water from your jar. And then she says to me, Drink, and I'll draw water from your cam for your camels too. Let her be the one the Lord has chosen for my master's son. Before I finished praying in my heart, Rebekah came out with her jar on her shoulder. She went down to the spring and drew water. And I said to her, please give me a drink. She quickly lowered her jar from her shoulder and said, drink, and I'll water your camels too. So I drank, and she watered the camels also. I asked her, whose daughter are you? She said, the daughter of Bethuel, son of Nahor, whom Milcah bore to him. Then I put the ring in her nose and the bracelets on her arms, and I bowed down and worshipped the Lord. I praised the Lord, the God of my master Abraham, who had led me on the right road to get the granddaughter of my master's brother for his son. Now if you will show kindness and faithfulness to my master, tell me, and if not, tell me, so I may know which way to turn. Laban and Bethuel answered, This is from the Lord. We can say nothing to you one way or the other. Here is Rebekah. Take her and go, and let her become the wife of your master's son, as the Lord has directed. When Abraham's servant heard what they said, he bowed down to the ground before the Lord. Then the servant brought out gold and silver, jewelry, and articles of clothing, and gave them to Rebekah. He also gave costly gifts to her brother and to her mother. Then he and the men who were with him ate and drank and spent the night there. When they got up the next morning, he said, Send me on my way to my master. But her brother and her mother replied, let the girl remain with us ten days or so, then you may go. But he said to them, Do not detain me, now that the Lord has granted success to my journey. Sit so I may go to my master. Then they said, Let's call the girl and ask her about it. So they called Rebekah and asked her, Will you go with this man? I will go, she said. So they sent their sister Rebekah on her way, along with her nurse and Abraham's servant and his men. And they blessed Rebekah and said to her, our sister, may you increase to thousands upon thousands. May your offspring possess the gates of their enemies. Then Rebekah and her maids got ready and mounted their camels and went back with the man. So the servant took Rebekah and left. Now Isaac had come from Beer Lahai Roy, for he was living in the Negev. 
He went out into the field one evening to meditate, and as he looked up, he saw camels approaching. Rebekah also looked up and saw Isaac. She got down from her camel and asked the servant, Who is that man in the field coming to meet us? He is my master, the servant answered. So she took her veil and covered herself. Then the servant told Isaac all he had done. Isaac brought her into the tent of his mother, Sarah, and he married Rebekah. So she became his wife, and he loved her, and Isaac was comforted after his mother's death. Thus far, the reading of God's holy word, may he bless it to the hands, hearts, and minds of his people. One commentator, uh, Henry Morris, writes about this passage. Not only is it a heartwarming love story, but it chronicles a very important episode in the history of man's redemption. Since Isaac is a type of Christ, according to the New Testament, it is not surprising that there are many fascinating parallels between the story of Isaac's search for a bride through the ministry of his father's entrusted servant and the sending forth of the Holy Spirit to take out of the Gentiles a people for his name, a bride for Christ. Of greater importance than the symbolism is the fact that the bride selected for Isaac had to be chosen with particular care since she would be the mother of the multitude of nations which God had promised would come through Abraham's seed through which the promised Savior would come and in which all the nations of the earth would be blessed. Though perhaps no other marriage has ever been more important than this one, all marriages, in fact the very institution of marriage, are a special concern to God. For this reason, Christian young people and their parents would do well to study carefully the principles guiding the preparations for this marriage as they contemplate their own. Now, maybe I don't necessarily agree with Morris on this being sort of a road map for how we should instruct people in Christian marriage. I don't know about you, but I don't know the last time a servant came up to a girl and shoved the nose ring in her ear or her nose and said, now you belong to my master's son. Um, but there are principles here that I think are good for us in the Christian life to ponder. And not only the, the typology of Christ in this narrative that we talked a little bit about last Sunday, um, but also uh, important elements that apply to the Christian life and how we live it. Um, the funny thing is, one of the uh, commentaries that I was looking at as I was preparing for this sermon pretty much said you shouldn't block this sermon up and or this text into the multiple sermons. You should just preach it as one sermon. So I didn't take that advice. Let's move forward. Our theme this morning is much like the theme from last Sunday, because we're in the same passage. God's faithfulness is seen in the provision he makes for his people. It just happens to be that in this particular passage, that provision is in uh, the form of a wife for the promised seed. We have four points this morning. The first is a welcome and a hunger strike, verse 28 through 33. The second is a retelling of the story, verse 34 through 49. The third, ver uh, third point is a woman with the heart of Abraham, verse 50 through 61. And the fourth is a love at first sight, verse 62 to 67. So let's start with that first point. Verses 28 through 33 basically tell us that uh, after this happened, after this encounter that uh, Abraham's servant had with Rebecca by the well, that Rebecca went home and she told her family about this. She went and told her mother's household about these things. Uh, and then we're introduced to a new character that we're going to learn more about later in Genesis. Laban. It's the brother of Rebecca. Um, he hurried out to the man of the spring. Uh, as soon as he'd seen the nose ring and the bracelets on his sister's arm, heard Rebecca tell what the man said to her, he went out, found the man, and he said, why don't you come into the household? So this is a welcome. This is a typical ancient Near Eastern welcome. Come, you who are blessed by the Lord, he said. Why are you standing out here? I prepared the house and a place for the camels. I I'm welcoming you in hospitality. I'm welcoming you um, and, of course, the interesting thing that I find about this passage is that the word used here by Laban um, in talking about God is the covenant name, Yahweh. So there seems to be, in some sense, that Nahor, Abraham's family, even though Abraham separated himself from them and went on to uh, the, the promise that he heard about Yahweh, uh, the God of Abraham. So the man went into the house, the camels were unloaded, everything was put forward, and the, and the meal was brought forward. Food was set before him, but this is what the servant said, I'm going on a hunger strike. 
I will not eat until I've told you what I have to say. This is how important this mission that Abraham has given to the servant, that it is to him. Um, I need to tell you why I've come. I need to tell you. I need to testify to what has happened, to what has come about, to the reasoning why I'm here. Now, at the end of the sermon last Sunday, I told you that one of the things that, that this servant teaches us is that in response to the realization that God has providentially been at work in our lives is the response of praise. It's praising God. It's saying to God, Praise be the Lord, the God of my master Abraham, who has not abandoned his kindness and faithfulness to my master. As for me, the Lord has led me on the journey to the house of my master's relatives. That's the response that the servant has, right, to the realization that God has sent his angel before him. God has providentially ordered his steps, right? Well, there's another response that we should have to the realization of God's work in our life. And that is to testify of it. That is to say that one of the purest forms of praise that we can have as Christian people who have been saved by God, who have been given grace by God in Jesus Christ our Lord, is to not only praise God, praise God about it, but praise God. God to others. Yes, it is true that God calls us to worship Him here on the Lord's Day, Lord's Day to gather and to lift up our voices and magnify the Lord. But it's also true that this is a bounce off point so that we may go and continue to praise the Lord throughout the week. We never stop praising the Lord. In private and in public. Our life is a life of praise to the Lord. And you can see that this servant understands that. Because not only there at the well does he say praise be to the Lord. But now as he enters into the house. As he is standing before the people that God has led him to. He wants to testify. He wants to testify to the work of God in his life. The work of God in his master's life. So not only is he welcomed, not only does he go on a hunger strike, but he retells the story. He testifies to Laban, to Rebekah's family, the goodness of God. Verses 34 through 49 are essentially recapping everything that has happened to this point. This is the evangelism moment, you could say, of this passage. Abraham's servant is, is, is sharing his form of the gospel in seed form before the full gospel is revealed later on. This is what God is working. This is what God is doing. And he wants to tell them about it. He wants to tell them about it. He says and acknowledges what God has been doing. Before I finished praying in my heart, Rebecca came out with her jar on her shoulder. She went down to the spring. She did exactly what I prayed about. I asked her, whose daughter are you? They said, she said, the daughter of Bethuel, son of Nahor, whom Milcah bore to him. All this stuff is what the Lord has been doing. And then at the end, he says, now if you will show kindness and faithfulness to my master, the same kindness and faithfulness that the Lord has shown to my master, if you'll show that, tell me. And if not, tell me so I may know which way to turn. He wants to know, has God brought him all the way to this point to not provide what God has brought him to, a wife for his master's son? Verse 50, we see the household of Rebecca's response to this testimony, to this sharing of the good news, sharing of the work of God in their life. Laban and Bethuel answered, This is from the Lord. We can say nothing to you one way or the other. Here is Rebecca, take her and go. And let her become the wife of your master's son. 
as the Lord has directed. This is the proper response. When we hear of the work that God is doing, when we're in prayer about what God is doing, are we in prayer about what God is doing, how God is working and moving in our lives, in the lives of others? Are we spiritually aware of these things? Are we questioning and wondering, how is God's spirit at work in my life? How is God's spirit at work in the lives of those that I love and are around me? How is God's spirit work at work in the lives of those I work with? How is God's spirit at work in this church and what he's calling us to do? These are things that we should be praying about. These are things that we should be considering and thinking. And we should be asking the Lord to give us wisdom, to give us discernment. We should be asking the Lord to help us see what is from him. To know his good and perfect and pleasing will, right? To be praying about what God is calling us to. What God is doing in our lives so we may follow that path. We may be obedient to him. And it's when Christians gather to pray about these things. It's when Christians in private pray about these things. That we have the same response as the household of Rebecca. This is from the Lord. We can say nothing to you one way or the other. This is from the Lord. We can say nothing to you. We give our stamp of approval to what is happening, to what is going on, because we recognize it and we acknowledge it as the moving of God, as the work of the Holy Spirit. This is what we're called to do. When we hear the story of God at work, when we're listening for it, and watching for it. Then we can say. This is from the Lord. And also very importantly. We can also say. This is not from the Lord. This is not some sort of emotional thing. That I'm speaking of. It's God's work. And it's the Holy Spirit in our heart with God's word that we discern what is from the Lord and what is not from the Lord. So God's faithfulness is seen in the provision he makes for his people. Abraham's servant is welcomed into the household and he is so set on speaking to them everything that's happened that he says, I will not eat until I get to tell you what has occurred until I get to tell you the work of God in my life, the work of God in my servant, my, Abraham, my master Abraham's life. And he retells the story. And the response we see from the family is they, they acknowledge, they acknowledge that this is from the Lord. And so they say, here's Rebecca, take her and go. Let her become the wife of your master's son as the Lord has directed so the servant has been able to say what he wanted to say. Um, the family has responded and said, yes, this is, the, this is from the Lord. Go ahead. And then when Abraham's servant heard what they said, he bowed down to the ground before the Lord. This is an answer to his prayers. This is the fulfillment of what the Lord was leading him to. And we see here that the servant brought out gold and silver jewelry and articles of clothing gave them to Rebecca. He also gave costly gifts to her brother and to her mother. This is what we call a dowry. This is not something we do anymore. In fact, I would like to think that uh, my commentator, Henry Morris, might want to rethink, um, okay, so how much gold and silver jewelry and articles of, of, articles of clothing and costly gifts do I need to... Uh, give to the family of my son's soon-to-be bride. Usually how we break those things down is like, we'll pay for the reception. <laughs> right? And now I'm going to have three sons and three daughters, and so I'm going to have, I don't know, 
Lots of weddings, guys. Lots of weddings. But if we look at this moment typologically, what I find interesting about this moment in the story when Abraham's servant brings forth gold and silver, articles of clothing, and gives them to Rebekah, all these costly gifts to her brother and to her mother. If we understand that Rebekah is us in this image, right? That Rebekah is not of the people of God. She's a Gentile like us. I mean, she's brought into the people of God through marriage, right? If we understand that Abraham's servant is the Holy Spirit who does the work of his master, who goes and who brings to his master a bride by purchasing her, purifying her. So what we have here is a picture of a bride being purchased by gold and silver and costly gifts. And the amount of gold and silver could have been millions and millions. The costly gifts given to the mother and, and the brother could have been of immense value. Because the point that the servant is trying to make is, look how much God has blessed Abraham. There should be no worry that your daughter, Rebecca, will not be taken care of, right? None of that can compare to the price Christ paid. His precious blood is so much greater in cost than silver and gold, clothing, costly gifts. He has purchased us with his very life. He has purchased us with his very life. We are called to give ourselves to one who has already given himself for us. I think it's a beautiful picture of the gospel here in this narrative of the marriage of Rebecca and Isaac. Our third point is a woman with the heart of Abraham. After this, the, uh, the, the groups, they, they have a meal together. They eat, they drink, they spend the night there. And when they get up the next morning, the, the servant is anxious to get on his way. Um, and I think one of the reasons why he's anxious to get on his way is because I think that Abraham asked his servant to do this as sort of like a last will and testament. Like, please make sure this happens. And in fact, since the very next chap chapter, we're told that Abraham passes, I think the servant is, is very uh, desire, desiring to get back to his master so that he can show his master that what he's promised has come uh, to do has come to fruition. That Abraham can die in peace knowing that his son has a, has a wife. And so he says, send me on my way to my master because it's kind. It's kind to ask it to be sent on their way um, after you've been uh, received into a household, uh, received hospitality. But her brother and her mother replied, let the girl remain with us 10 days or so, then you may go. I mean, well, I mean, what's the reasoning here? Well, the reasoning here is just, we're realizing that this has happened so fast, and we're realizing that we will most likely never see Rebecca again. She's gone. She's going to go away to a place far from here, and we'll never see her again. And so we love her, and, we, and we'd like to spend some time with her. But the servant is very, uh, very adamant that he does not want to be detained. He wants to go, uh, since the Lord has granted him success, and he wants to be on his journey so he can go to his master. And like I said, I think he really wants to go so that he can get there before Abraham passes and show uh, that the Lord has given Abraham, uh, made sure that there's a, a wife uh, for his son, Isaac. And so they do something that I think was probably very uncommon um, in those days. Um, in those days, uh, it, it would be very uncommon to ask the woman what her feeling was about this. 
The family had decided this is who you're going to marry, and, th- and that's the deal. You go on your merry way, and you don't make any complaints. That was just how things were done back then. But what they do is they say, let's call the girl and ask her about it. Because maybe they thought to themselves, if she says, yeah, I'd like to stay for a little while, then the servant can't really make any complaints at that point. So they called Rebecca and they asked her personally, will you go with this man? And her response is, I will go. I will go. Now why I said a woman with the heart of Abraham is because not only is Rebecca herself acknowledging personally that she believes this is of the Lord. Not only is Rebecca acknowledging that she wants to do what the Lord is, is bringing about. But Rebecca herself is acknowledging that at this point I am breaking away from this family. I'm going on a long journey to a land I've never been to. To receive a husband I've never seen or met. The biggest blind date ever. But she desires to do so. This is Rebecca's Abraham moment. God calls to Abraham. Separate yourself from your family. Come this way. I promise you all these blessings, right? And Abraham does so. Rebecca is being said, do you want to go with this man? Do you want to go and join in with this family? And she says, I will go. I will go. So they sent their sister Rebecca on her way, along with her nurse and Abraham's servant and his men. And they blessed Rebecca and said to her, Our sister, may you increase to thousands upon thousands. May your offspring possess the gates of their enemies. I think this is probably just a very generic, ancient Near Eastern blessing upon someone who leaves the family to go and to be married to another person. This is just saying, may blessing be upon you. But I don't think that, that Rebecca's family understands and knows how true what they're saying is. That their blessing in her coincides with and does not contradict the blessing that God has given to Abraham and his descendants. Actually, it kind of falls short. And may you increase to thousands upon thousands. How about all the sand on the seashore and the stars in the sky? May your offspring possess the gates of your enemies, of their enemies. How about you shall inherit the whole world. But they send her on her merry way. Rebecca and her maids got got ready, mounted their camels, and went back with the man. So the servant took Rebecca and left. They're on their journey. She's not turning back. She is walking by faith now. She is acknowledging that this is the Lord's doing. And she is broken away in a very real sense, from the seed of the serpent to be the seed of the woman. May we all have the same heart that Rebecca had. May we all be willing to look at this world and its empty promises. May we all be able to look at what this world has to offer as temporary, as a broken cistern, and we may be able to turn from its promises To break from our relationship to sin. And our relationship to Satan. And the ways of this world. And say, I will go. I will go. I will be married to Christ. I will forsake this world for a world to come. I'll no longer be a slave to sin. I'll be a slave to Christ. I'll give up all that I can have in this life. Knowing that there's a life to come where there's so much more. May we have the same heart that she had.
This brings us to the end of our story. We zoom back to where Isaac is. We hear where he's been living. We see that one night he goes out to the field to meditate. And he looks up and he sees the camels approaching. He's probably going like this. Man, I hope she's pretty. <laughs> she's probably thinking the same thing. I hope he's not ugly. Rebecca looks up, sees Isaac. She got down. She asked the servant, who is this? And he says, it's my master. So she goes and she bails herself, which is well, what all women do before they're married. In this world, this culture, it's an expression of modesty. She covers herself. And the servant comes and gives a report to Isaac about all that he had done. This is a precursor. It, it helps us to see that uh, the, the, the management of the family and the household is transitioning from Abraham to Isaac. Isaac is now the man of the household. Isaac is now um, taking the place of Abraham. And what we're told here is probably the very uh, most succinct way that you can express uh, a marriage in, in these days. Which, you know, a marriage probably happened like weeks at a time, like a celebration, and all kinds of things like that. We'll learn more about it when Jacob goes to be with Laban, and, and there's this whole thing that happens uh, there. We're, we're told this, Isaac brought her into the tent of his mother, Sarah, and he married Rebekah. And so we're seeing here too, at passing the baton, Rebekah is the new Sarah, the matriarch of the faith. So she became his wife, and he loved her, and Isaac was comforted after his mother's death. I love these words because I think to myself how simple and meaningful words like this are in the Bible. Sometimes we look at the scriptures and we think it has to be these big, huge, um, supernatural um, things and realities. You know, sometimes we look at the Bible and we think to ourselves, wow, there was a moment in the Bible when God stopped the sun so that Joshua could defeat the armies. We look at the Bible and sometimes we're like, wow, some, this, this one moment in the Bible where these three men were thrown into a fiery furnace and they didn't burn up because there was a fourth person in there. And we look at the Bible and we say, wow, look at this moment in Egypt when there's all these, um, um, all these plagues and all these things that happened. The sun was darkened. The firstborn was killed. There were locusts. You see all these big things, right? And we think God is a, is a God of big things like this. And he is. God is also the God of comforting people who have lost their mother. And sometimes when we think God is this big God, we often wonder how insignificant our lives are. We can't do big things like that. How is what we're doing meaningful to God? How is He using my life? I've never gone into battle. With the sun stopped over us. And then you read something like this. Isaac was comforted after his mother's death. Of course, we're not all lovely women who can marry men that will comfort somebody who lost a mother. But we are somebody who can have the heart of God and compassion of God to see someone who's going through a hard time, a difficult time, and reach out a hand and say, how you doing? Is there something I could be praying for you about? Hey, maybe you just need somebody to talk to. I'm here. We all do know somebody who's lost a loved one. We can write a card to give him a call. And I think that's what's so beautiful about God's word is that it's big things and it's small things. It's everything. God providentially ordered all these events so that Isaac could have a bride that would be the seed of the woman that would bring about 
that promised Messiah. But also, God brought about all these things so that he could comfort Isaac on the loss of his mother. My prayer to us is that we would see God's faithfulness and the provision he makes for us as people. Maybe in great events that have occurred in our lives that have brought us to the place we are right now, but maybe also in the little things that remind us that God cares for us. Comforts us in times of need. And especially as we turn in our worship service from the word to the sacrament, we would be reminded always of God's ultimate faithfulness to us and his provision for us and the salvation that we have in Jesus Christ. That we are the bride that have been purchased. Not by gold and silver and costly gifts, but by the most costly gift. The blood of Jesus Christ. Dying on the cross. Three days later, raised from the dead. And is seated now at the right hand of God. And has poured out the Holy Spirit upon us. Right now we await that great day that is in our future. The wedding supper of the Lamb. That day in which we will gather together as God's people. And we will have received, just like Rebecca, articles of clothing. Because we'll be wearing the white robes of the righteousness of Jesus Christ. And they will have been washed in his blood. And we will stand before God and we will praise him and the land that was slain before the foundation of the world for our salvation. And we will praise God that we get to spend forever in the new heavens and the new earth with God and with Christ in perfect communion and union with him. And may we know, may we know God's faithfulness for us and the provision he makes for his people and his son, Jesus Christ. Amen. We pray with you. Heavenly Father, thank you and that you did not forsake us, but you have made us the bride of Christ. May we, Heavenly Father, not only praise you for your providence in our lives, but we, may we praise you to others. May we testify and give testimonies of your faithfulness to us in our lives. May we, Heavenly Father, be reminded and never forget that we were purchased not by precious jewels and gold and silver, but by the precious blood of Jesus Christ, our Savior. May we, Heavenly Father, forsake the world and have the heart of Abraham just like Rebecca and go. Go with Christ, our groom. And receive with him all his inheritance, this world and everything that is in it. And may we, Heavenly Father, know that you are a God of big things and small things. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Will you sing with me? Psalter hymnal 422 verses 1 through 4. O 